extremely violent, unforecast uh, storm hit Maui. Well, not even a storm because the air was still and very weirdly foggy, but there were these giant waves and they built and they built and they built um, and they were not predicted by any of the surf line or any of the weather models thought everything was going to California. I, I went to California because that was supposedly where all the action was going to be. Meanwhile, on Maui, Laird's wife was about to ha have a baby, so he didn't go, he wasn't going anywhere. And the biggest waves of all came to Maui. So Laird went out with Brett Lickle, another one of the pioneering tow surfers, and there was only one other team out there, Sierra Emery and another man named John Denny. That's absolutely unheard of. There would be, on a big day, you know, 40 teams out now. So not only were there only four of them, and so it was a little spooky, they couldn't see. And so Laird's helicopter safety guy couldn't find him and couldn't find him in A, the airport head was on VFR, so they couldn't, because they couldn't even see the landing, and so they couldn't be in the airspace. And the biggest waves, the ones they were trying to surf that day were right in the landing path of the airport. So they went out by themselves, they had no photographers, they thought they were maybe gonna have 30 foot waves. Well, they ended up with like 100 to 120 foot waves by the end of the day. And there was, at one point, Laird was on a wave that was so big and was so unlike anything he'd ever surfed before that the wave was gonna close out on top of him. And I can't even tell you how big that wave is, and he doesn't really use numbers, but I would imagine it was close to a 100-foot wave. He couldn't make the drop, and so he, he went back up as high as he could and punched through the wave. He dove into it. So then Brett on the jet ski was going to have to go pick him up, which is fine. But the problem is there's another wave right behind it, another 100-foot wave right behind it. So they, they went in. Brett grabbed him. They were on the jet ski, and they had complete, like, clean water ahead of them so they thought they were going to get out here's this wave just howling behind them the wave went so fast so different than any other wave they'd ever seen before that it just blew them into the sky so they're in the sky there's white water these waves when they break create foam and aerated water that can be you know itself 30 and 40 feet high some of these white waters are almost like giant waves themselves so they were both in the water and they just kept getting hit over and over by white water by white water by white water it just violent like it's it's really quite astonishing that they lived in the jet ski who knows where that is and they're two miles offshore and there's no visibility so the other team is not going to find them uh, Laird comes up and he sees Brett fairly close to him and Brett is surrounded in a pool of blood um, and also Frecklesville where they were is the place where tiger sharks large ones are known to be so Laird is like what is going on he comes over Brett Brett needs a tourniquet and and um, so Laird just pulled off his wetsuit and used his wetsuit to tie a tourniquet and saw that Brett's leg was flayed from the ankle to the knee like two as he described it two curtains hanging there like and he was bleeding out really fast he couldn't find the jet ski and then he looked and he saw it but it was it was about you know 600 700 yards away like close to a half a mile away and moving in the opposite direction Somehow he swam out to that. I don't know how he did it in the surf and the churning surf. Got it. And when he got there, he realized that there's a risk thing that you use to start the jet ski. And when you, if you were to be fly off it or something, what happens is it pops off and the jet ski stops. It's like a safety device. They call it a lanyard. The lanyard was on Brett's wrist and had gotten blown off somewhere. And it was really, at this point, literally life or death, whether they were going to be able to get Brett back alive he needed to get this jet ski so he had to figure out a way to start it to do this and he found he managed to jerry rig something from a pair of um i ipod headphones that were in the glove compartment so all this like each one of these things is unlikely and for them to all add up he goes back he gets brett he manages to get him kind of on the rescue sled brett is really hanging by a thread they have to go back through the the 40 foot sh like, closeout surf that's ringing the whole North Shore at this point and they get to the beach and the swell is so intense that the water is washed 200 yards into the parking lot and the lifeguards are running all over the place because all their life-saving equipment has been toppled over and and then they see Laird come up buck naked onto the beach with Brad and Brad is leg is hanging two pieces and uh and every sirens are running and the fire department came and Laird had a radio and had called for an ambulance so they get Brad into the ambulance Laird had also gotten pretty badly hurt, and one leg was about twice the size of the other from the shin. Um, turns to Sierra Emery, the other, one of the other toe surfers who was on the other partner, on the other team, and says, all right, let's go, let's go, back out there. 
I didn't even know that for about a week after I started hearing the story. That came out and it was like, wait. So you, okay, I, I thought they'd gone out twice. I thought they went out once to, because they changed out their gears. I didn't know they had gone out, that he had put his partner in the ambulance where he was probably close to death and then gone back out into 100 foot waves. Like hearing that I, it made, made me think of something that Laird's wife, Gabby Reese, told me one time when I first started following him around. She said, people know that Laird is intense, but they have no idea how much. And, and that was when I really understood what she meant. 